All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I've been going on at length about uh, the virtues of deep neural networks, convolutional neural networks specifically, and uh, I hope I have not given the impression that uh, they can do everything and anything because they can't. Yeah? And today I want to introduce a different sort of problem where a neural network as such would be of no help. And I want to show you the tools which will allow you to solve that kind of problem. And uh, the, this class of tools is part of a framework, a formalism, which is alternatively called Bayesian networks or probabilistic graphical models, specifically directed probabilistic graphical models. All right, this example, which you will find in the, in the public document, uh, shows the uh, lineage of John. Uh, John is a, a young horse, and uh, this is its lineage tree. And uh, that example is taken from the, the textbook that you see on the side. Uh, so, so why do we, do we care about the lineage tree? Uh, because I think this was a real-world example. Uh, because John happened to be uh, sick from a hereditary disease. And the question was, now, which of the other horses might be a carrier of that disease? Now, before we turn to the math, um, we need a, a bit of a reminder of biology here. Um, this is a scheme I'm showing you how a so-called autosomal recessive disease is being transmitted. And... Um, these autosomal recessive diseases are the reason why it's not a good idea to have children with uh, one sister or one's cousin or so. Okay? Um, so we have um, a set of um, we have a set of uh, we have a set of genes, and uh, we usually have for each chromosome uh, except the X and Y, uh, we have two copies, um, two copies which are uh, not identical. Um, we have inherited one copy um, from, so let's say one chromosome. You see father has two copies, mother has two copies. Now, um, when uh, you look at a sperm of the father, then the sperm uh, gets to hold only one of the two copies. If uh, you look at the egg of the mother, this egg holds only one of the two copies, which is uh, the reason why us and our siblings are not identical, yeah? because um, each one of, our, of us siblings can get from the father this or that chromosome, and then we don't have just one, but what was it, 23 or something? Uh, I forget. And the mother has two copies. Yeah? And so there is, uh, uh, if, you, if, you don't, if you don't create identical twins, um, there's a finite but extremely small chance that you are genetically identical to your sibling. Yeah? Now, uh, in this class of diseases, um, just one of the copies of the chromosome is affected, while the other copy is unaffected. And uh, in this type of disease, um, you are fine as long as uh, you don't have two affected copies. Yeah, so if we look at this mother and this father, who are both carriers of an autosomal recessive disease, um, they might have a child uh, which gets uh, two healthy copies. Um, they might get a child which has one healthy and one affected copy. Those are the so-called carriers. And, uh, and there is a chance that uh, a child may get two of the affected copies, and then this child will actually show the disease in, in its phenotype. Yeah? So the carriers, uh, you don't see usually that there are carriers of this disease, but it's the pure ones that uh, really show the, um, well, the sick phenotype. And as you see, there is the biggest chance of uh, having carriers as offspring. Uh, because, well, that uh, the carrier might have gotten the defect gene from the father or from the mother. 
All right, so this is the biology. And uh, this biology uh, lets us now um, bring a bit of information in this uh, lineage tree that we've seen before. Um, so specifically, um, if uh, we just take um, the prior distribution, so let's say in, uh, in this class of horses, um, there is a 1% chance of uh, being carrier of this autosomal recessive disease and a 99% chance of being uh, healthy or having a pure phenotype or pure genotype, excuse me. Um, so you see that these are, what we see here are, when we have no, uh, when we have not made any observations except that all of the forefathers of John were not sick. Uh, so we've ruled out that they are sick. They can be either carrier or pure. Um, then we can compute, well, what is the probability that John is a carrier or pure or sick? And these numbers are rounded, so the chance that John is sick is not you know, exactly zero, but it's pretty small, uh, because there is just a 1% chance of both parents uh, being carrier, and he, uh, John would have to inherit the bad gene from both parents in order to be sick. All right, this is before we make any observations. But now we can uh, ask, what if uh, we test John and he turns out to be pure? Well, then we can, uh, or we're interested in updating these estimates. Or we can ask, what if John is a carrier? Then we get these different estimates. And you see that they're already very different. You know, if you look at the grandparents here, you see there's now, uh, this has really boosted the chances of, uh, for example, Anne being a carrier. or we can say we've actually made the observation that John was a sick horse baby, and uh, we're then interested in, in computing the probabilities of um, the adults being carrier. And you see that the, the numbers change again. Yeah? And now this uh, transcends the realm of logic. Okay? If, we, if we were logicians, then we could say, all right, uh, I observe that John is sick. I also know that the parents, Henry and Irene, that they were definitely not sick, so they can have been either carrier or pure. Well, and if John had two bad copies of that gene, then as a consequence, we know for sure that Henry and Irene must have been carriers. This is logic, and it's correct, and everybody agrees. Um, now, beyond that, unfortunately, uh, logic no longer helps us. Yeah? So logic in the sense of making here one or zero true or false statements. Yeah? So logic works for figuring out what's going on with the parents of John, but it does not help us with the earlier <coughs> ancestors. And well, you see that uh, John's lineage is a bit special because normally you have two parents, you have four grandparents, and then you have eight great-grandparents. And John has two parents, four grandparents, but only five great-grandparents. Okay, so um, on the one hand, when you are into breeding horses, there is this temptation. Yeah, you had a really somehow whatever, let's say, fast great-grandfather, and you want this great-grandfather to father many children. Uh, but you know, if you're not careful, then uh, you might well end up with a lineage tree that's not enough of a tree. You have too many loops in this graph, and that really increases the chances of you know, something going wrong of a uh, baby horse being sick. Good. So th um, that's the problem I would like uh, to pose today. And uh, well, I think you see that convolutional neural networks out of the box, they're all great, <laughs> but there are no help here. Yeah? So we need a different framework. And uh, the framework we will use are graphical models that have been dubbed uh, marriage between probability theory and graph theory. And I will now make a, a series of somewhat um, um, abstract statements. And we will look at graphical models today and at least uh, the next two times that we meet. Um, some of these statements, I think, will make more sense uh, when, when you look back at them in a while. All right? um, in general, in such graphical models, we can inject prior knowledge, on the one hand, um, through the structure of the graphical model. And from this structure and from the observations that we make, 
uh, we can find out what random variables are conditionally independent of others. We can inject prior knowledge through the factors or these conditional probability tables um, within um, such a graphical model. And we can inject knowledge through evidence. For example, the John Bosick. Um, overall, these graphical models, if we draw a particular graphical model, this sketches a family of probability distributions, namely um, a family of probability distributions um, whose members have a density that factorizes in a, in a special way. What we get out are um, well, nice diagrammatic representations. And, and these, in turn, have helped making graphical models a, a unifying language. Um, they have helped us understand methods that were developed in different fields and for different problems under one single framework. So specifically, um, next time I want to discuss with you hidden Markov models and how they can be used for robot localization. And the time after that, I want to discuss the Kalman filter with you. And you see that in the language of graphical models, this hidden Markov model, the Kalman filter, which were developed in completely different fields, completely different purposes, um, that in terms of graphical models, they're extremely similar. So if I just draw the graphical model itself, it would even be the identical model. Yeah? And uh, in that sense, it has helped understand the commonalities of methods that have been developed. And it has also proved to be a nice modular framework to, to develop new methods. All right. And by the way, it's, you know, it's well understood mathematically. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of good reasons to be interested in probabilistic graphical models. All right. Now, what is a directed probabilistic graphical model? Um, well, it is, as the name implies, we'll have a directed graph. And what's interesting in this graph are essentially the missing arrows. And I want to explain why. So uh, let's say if we have um, some distribution of random variables A, B, C, and D using this uh, chain rule of probability, I can always write it, for example, as the probability of A given B, C, D times the probability of B given C and D times the probability of C given D times the probability of D, for example. And that is not unique. Yeah? I could also have said that uh, it's also the same as you know make up something different. Um, let's say, probability of C given A, B, and D times the probability of, yeah, why not? B uh, given A and D times the probability of D given A times the probability of A, and many others. Yeah? So uh, you can invent many different factorizations of the same joint distribution here. Um, let's look at this particular one. In graphical models, we always show what uh, random variables, a random variable is conditioned on. Yeah? So for example, um, if I try and sketch this, we would have a random variable d, and then we would have a random variable c um, that's here conditioned on d. And then I have B conditioned in C and D. And then I have A like this. All right. Now, um, and these other factorizations, they would correspond to other but similar graphs. Um, now we can ask, what if I uh, omit most of these arrows? Uh, so for example, I could say 
Um, let's just make this here a chain model like that. And I delete this arrow and this arrow and that arrow. Then I would write that uh, then we would have the probability of A given B and probability of B given C of C given D and probability of D. And well, that is the same as the expression above if and only if um, a few relations hold. So in particular, um, I would need that the probability of A given B, C, and D is the same as the probability of A given B. And that in turn means that A is independent of C and D if I condition on B. So in words, I can say A is conditionally independent of C, D given B. And I would also have to make the assumption that the probability of B given C and D is just the same as the probability of B given C, which would mean that B is conditionally independent of D given C. And the other two terms are the same. I don't need to make any more assumptions. OK. Um, so the expression on the bottom, this here, uh, it is both simpler than the expression above. And if I want to uh, give meaning to it by really specifying these conditional probability tables, it's also a, well, the tables are much smaller. Um, but it's an equality, or the simple expression is uh, equivalent to the complicated one only if these assumptions that we've uh, written here, only if these assumptions really hold. And now in this ABCD example, I don't know if they hold, uh, but, but in the horse example, you can sort of imagine that we must have some of these uh, uh, independencies. Yeah? So uh, for example, um, as long as we have no observation, Um, as long as we have made no observation, then I can say for sure, you know, uh, K and L, these random variables are independent. But as soon as I start making an observation, like uh, John being sick, for example, um, then these random variables become coupled. Yeah. And uh, this is the kind of information that is encapsulated, and I will give you more details on how and why. This is the kind of information that we can encapsulate in such a graphical model and in an analysis of its connectivity pattern, specifically in terms of so-called deseparation. Good. So here, this was an, just an example. Okay. Now let's uh, make a general statement. Yeah? So definition. A Bayesian network or a directed probabilistic graphical model or sometimes this is just abbreviated directed graphical model.
it is uh, given by an by a directed acyclic graph or DAG for short. Where we have one node in this graph per <coughs> random variable, where we have one conditional probability distribution, or CPD for short. Per node, so this tells us what a random variable. I'm going to use capital letter now for random variable. Um, it, it it tells us what random variable i uh, depends on, namely on all random variables that are parents of i. Okay, this is a Bit of a funny notation. This here means this is the set of all parents of random variable i. And parents are random variables that have an arrow pointing towards i. And we have the following rule. And this is now the most important thing to remember. We have a rule that tells us how the joint distribution of n random variables factorizes. Namely, it's just a product over all vertices. So I did not introduce a set V, let's say. Yeah? This directed acyclic graph is a graph G with a set of vertices V and a set of edges E. And this is now the set of vertices that I'm referring to here. Probability of x i given x parents of i. All right, so th this last one is the important statement to remember when you when you talk about what is a directed graphical model. I will give you an example, OK? Um, let's do it again for the horses. I'm <coughs> just copying this. I'll be back in a moment. Let me give you a concrete example for this boxed last equation. Um, you can also just watch me write, because I think you will, you know, you will see just in a moment how this goes. I'm going to abbreviate the horses by just their first letter. So um, the probability, the joint probability of all horses being in some state. I'm going to factorize as follows. I'm going to say this is the probability of John given Henry and Irene. See, John depends only on its parents. So in the example I gave above, yeah, I had these arrows everywhere. Yeah, and now we don't have all the arrows. We only have a subset of the arrows. And that's what makes this model interesting. Yeah. So John. Uh, uh, depends immediately only on Henry and Irene. 
and uh, then I have the probability of Henry uh, given Frank and Dorothy and Irene given Eric and Gwen and then Frank given L and Anne and Dorothy given Anne and Brian Eric given Brian and Cecily Gwen given again Anne and Kay and now finally for the ancestors themselves we have these univariate terms P of L P of A P of B P of C, P of K. Okay, and we can compare this. You know, it looks formidable, but this is now what I know is the joint distribution of all of them. Yeah, so so I could again give all the letters now. So I want to argue. You know why this is such a terribly complicated looking expression? Why is this supposed to be simpler than just having or specifying the joint distribution in itself? Yeah? To that end, um, let's first look at, um, I mentioned here, this conditional probability distribution for each node. Let's look at that. So, for example, Example of a conditional probability distribution. I'm taking uh, Gwen as an example here. The probability of Gwen given Anne and K. Is a table that looks as follows. Um, Gwen, we know that she's not sick, um, so Gwen is either pure or carrier. So here I'm writing, for example, the probability that uh, Gwen is pure, given N and K, and then we have the possible states for N and the possible states for K. N herself can be carrier or pure, and K can be carrier or pure. And now we need uh, the biology. So if the parents were both pure, so they had no affected gene, then the child of necessity is uh, also pure. So we're not normalizing yet. So I'm putting currently a one here. Um, if N was pure and K was a carrier, that means from a Gwen from her mother, for sure she got a healthy gene, and from the father she could get the healthy or the affected gene. Yeah? So 50-50 chance, uh, hence I'm putting a one-half here. For the same reason, I'm putting a one-half there. And um, for the child to be pure when both parents are carrier, then the child has to get the healthy gene from the father, that's the chance of one-half, the healthy gene from the mother, that's the chance of one half. I multiply these, so it gives me one quarter. And um, in the top left corner here, I'm now putting some constant because um, this was just a table for Gwen being in the pure state. But moreover, we need a similar table for say C1 and C2 times the probability of Gwen being K 
carrier given A and K. And then again, K can be carrier or pure, and N can be carrier or pure. So if both parents were pure, then there is a zero chance of the child being a carrier. If one parent was pure, then there is a one half chance of the child becoming a carrier. And if both parents were a carrier, then I think there is a one half chance of the child being carrier also. Good. And now all of this together, this here is the this conditional probability distribution or conditional probability table. And uh, we need those constants uh, C1 and C2 because um, when I normalization tells me that whenever I have you know, some random variable A given B, and I now um, sum over all possible values A, then, then I should obtain a 1. Yeah? And this I can use to find out what should be the values here for C1 and C2. So this would be um, uh, a conditional probability distribution or conditional probability table for Gwen. And in fact, we have similar conditional probability tables here for each of the horses in the lineage. Yeah? So this is how we build our model. And you have a question. Yeah, two things. Uh, first of all, I think the one half for both being carrier on the right hand side should be the three uh, fourth, because we have three uh, different um, possibilities with the probability one fourth for the child being a carrier. That one, yeah. This one? So I, um, I don't know. I was inspired by this picture. Yeah? I figured uh, this was the corresponding case, that both parents are carriers. And uh, then we have here the four possible cases. Um, there's a one quarter chance of the child being affected. There's a one quarter chance of the child being unaffected and two quarters um, because it could get the bad gene either from this parent or from that parent. Uh, so we are um, not counting an affected child as a carrier because... We're the, not... What? The affected child is also carrying the gene, so we're not counting the affected child as a carrier. Yeah. So it's not the affected child that causes the affected child to become a carrier. So it's more like the gene that is causing the affected Yeah, so know that uh, Gwen was not a sick horse. Or else, she, because you know this shows to, it shows in the phenotype, so she would not have been allowed to have children and so on. Yeah. Um, so uh, here in this language, uh, when we talk about the horses, we call them sick. In this picture, um, there um, this child is called affected, uh, and that's not called carrier. Yeah. So carrier is when you just have one defect copy of the okay, gene. If we know that the No, you know, the, if the Gwen had been sick, we would have the probability of, we would have an extra table, probability Gwen being sick, given A and K. And this table would have looked like, you know, if one of the children is, uh, if one of the parents is healthy, then there's no way. Uh, if both parents are carriers, then there's a one 
quarter chance that uh, the horse is sick. Yeah? So this would complete the table, except that I knew that Gwen was not sick, so I've omitted this table. I've injected the evidence that you know this is not the case. This has not happened. Um, so if I rule this thing out, the one on the right hand side, this changes C1 and C2, but it does not change the relative numbers. Yeah? Yes? So C1 and C2 have to depend on A and K, don't they? Because, for example, if A and K are all pure, they also already add up to 1, 1 to 0. So only the carrier carrier case. Um, but only that case, we need to scale probability. And also, I think C1 and C2 have to be equal in that case. Um, G, not, G not being sick is, isn't any evidence on whether. Uh, okay, so uh, C1 and C2 should be the same. You are right, yeah? So I just have C, that's correct. And what was the other statement? Um, they also should depend on A and K. C should depend on A and K. For example, if A and K are both pure, then C should just be one. Um, and if they're both carriers, we need something different. Mm, no. Um, so you know what we do is we sum up all these numbers. And we know that they should give one, but they are something larger than one. So I divide all the numbers by this whatever sum I found but don't sum previously. No. Yes. Oh my. So you're um, you're correct. We um, I have to do the conditioning per a and k. So that means, um, for example, that. Okay, you're right. Thank you. So um, let's say the we can make the case that um, G being pure, given that uh, whatever A is carrier and K is also carrier, yeah. Um, and now I'm just interested in what is the probability of G being here in different states. And uh, then I have the uh, one quarter and one half, but together, so that's three quarters, but together they should make up one. So, I'm, so I would get the numbers one fourth times four third and one half times Four third, and I would have similarly to normalize the others. Yeah, you're correct. Good. Um, so let me write up to normalization these numbers. All right. So we have now very similar looking tables um, throughout this uh, graph. And I still wanted to explain you know, why this complicated looking ex expression, why that could be attractive at all. Yeah? Um, now, we can look at the naive parametrization here. So let's look uh, first at this one here. Um, what are the number of states if I write a probability of 
the joint of John and Henry and Irene and so on and so on. Yeah? Then um, John has uh, actually uh, three states because he could be, before I make an observation, he could be sick or carrier or pure. Um, but all the others have two states. They're either carrier or pure. And uh, I, have, I have 11 ancestors. Yeah? So um, this is times 2 to the power of 11. And Uh, to the power of 10 is 1024, 2048, so this is uh, 3 times 2048. Um, so it's, uh, no, it's around 6,100 states that I have here. And so if I now want to look up what is the probability of a specific configuration of horses being carrier or pure, or if I want to uh, marginalize over this table or so, I always have to deal with this um, very high dimensional thing. Yeah? So this is also a conditional probability distribution, uh, except it has very many arguments, as opposed to uh, down here, where I always ever have two arguments. Yeah? So let's look at this uh, other parametrization here, um, the blue one. In this case, um, for the ancestors, I have I have five ancestors, and each ancestor can have two states. Yeah, so this would be five times two for this uh, last last row here. Um, then I have. One, two, three, four, five, six uh, horses where, uh, so I have six horses. Um, each horse can be in uh, two states. And then for each of these states, we have these uh, tables with uh, four entries. And then we have John. So we have uh, one horse, which had uh, three possible states, and each possible state um, depended again on four parents. So we have 12, we have 48, and we have 10. So we have uh, 70 states uh, overall. that I need to specify. Um, actually, thanks to normalization, I lose a few parameters. Um, so overall, what we have here is, uh, in, in the top example, is if I want to specify this complete distribution, I need around 6,000 parameters. And uh, with this uh, second, with this uh, funny factorization, I only need around 70 parameters or a bit less even. Um, and this is essentially thanks to all the missing arrows. Yeah? This is because we knew that uh, the state of Irene depends on her forefathers, but not on uh, horses that it, that it is completely unrelated to. Okay, and, um, so this discrepancy here, This makes for great savings in the complexity of the description. Um, but also in terms of computational effort, if we want to now do anything with these numbers.
So um, is it clear where these numbers came from here? Um, so the five times two. Um, this was because we had we had these uh, five forces here. In the equation, they were here, five forces. And uh, where L can be carrier of pure, there's two states. A can be carrier of pure, there's two states. Yeah? So I have five times two. This is those. Um, then I have uh, six horses. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six horses. Six horses, each of which can be in two different states, can be pure or carrier. And uh, then it always depends on, well, four possible combinations of what its parents could be. We have four numbers here. So this the six times two times four. And then finally, we have John as a special case. It's one horse, three possible states, carry pure or sick. And it again depends on its four possible combinations of what its parents could have been. So this is why we get to around 70 states, or, or a bit less, a bit fewer parameters. And this we have to compare to a huge table where we say for each combination of all of these horses being in one of those states, what is the probability of that? And, that, and that's a much, much bigger number here. So this is where we get these great savings from this structured description. Good. Let's have a break at this point. And after the break, we will talk about inference. We will talk about how to actually now find those numbers that were here shown, uh, that were here shown as these bars, uh, depending on uh, what what evidence we had injected into our graph. Let's have a break, and 